Now, folks, now is the time. Started a new uh, focus, fit for the new year. You saw that video earlier, didn't you? Uh, fit for the new year. Now we are children of God. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. This week's message is now put off the sinful nature. And all I can say about that is easier said than done. Let's take a look, though, a little closer. You might remember from last week's message what it means to be a child of God. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, we, all, we, we know that all people are created in the image of God. All people are greatly loved by God. But true children of God are those who have received Jesus and believe in his name. Those who are redeemed by the blood of Christ. You remember from last week also about God's out-of-this-world kind of love. On display in the person of Jesus Christ, he's the one who can redeem us from our sinful human nature, hear me now, redeem us from our sinful human nature and make us more into the likeness of God's children. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Because of God's amazing, otherworldly love, we are now children of God. Just how amazing is the power of God's love is illustrated by where we came from, spiritually speaking. Remember your reality. It's possible that some of us has for, have forgotten what we really were before God saved us through Jesus. Romans chapter 5 helps us remember. It says, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were God's enemies, four words describe, describe our spiritual condition outside of Christ. Those words are powerless, ungodly, sinners, and enemies of God. Well, that's more than four words, but, you know, enemies of God is three words, but four concepts there describe us outside of Christ. When we were powerless to change our ways, Christ came for us. When we were ungodly, Christ still loved us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And even though we were actually God's enemies, Christ reconciled us to God. Now, many of you know that our church supports the mission at Kern, at Kern County. It's down there on East uh, 24th Street. And there they uh, have a Christian ministry to help the homeless and those who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Counselors at the mission will tell you that the hardest part of the process for those addicted is admitting that they need help. Even for us, it's very difficult to be totally honest about our problems or the messes in our lives. How easy it is for us to rationalize, to minimize, to make excuses, to tell part of the truth but not all of the truth. Now, those who have been through the recovery program at the mission will tell you that the first step is the hardest one and it's also the most crucial step. Until you face the bad news about your condition, you won't truly and totally turn your life over to God and ask for his help. 
The same is true for all of us. No matter what our personal issues may be, it takes a while for most of us to realize just how deep and pervasive sin is in our lives. It is so endemic in our human nature that it has left us powerless and enslaved, totally unable to save ourselves. And you know, that's what we're trying to do all the time. See, God, I am good enough. Until we admit that very thing, that we're powerless to save ourselves, our lives will never really get better. Sometimes, though, we send out a different message. We say to ourselves, how fortunate God is to have me in his family. But it's not like that at all. God didn't save you because he looked down from heaven and said, my, my, she stands head and shoulders above all those other sinners. She would be a real asset to my kingdom. I think I'll save her. There was no merit in you that caused God to save you. There aren't enough rules we can follow, not enough good deeds we can do to merit being God's children. It was pure, sovereign love that reached out and took you in. God desires that his enemies should become his children. And that's why he saved you and me, and offers the same to anyone. With that said, let's remember at the same time that we are God's children now, and we have a Father in heaven whose name we bear. I bear his image as do you, and by his divine grace, we are his true sons and daughters. We've been adopted into God's family by the miracle of new birth in the Spirit. And so we want to honor our Father and His name. And that's why we take seriously these words from from Scripture that we heard earlier. But now you must rid yourselves of all things such as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Well, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Put off, rid yourselves of these things like, you know, anger, rage, malice, filthy language, don't lie, all that kind of stuff. And just just put on the compassion, the kindness, the humility, gentleness, and patience. Huh. Well, it's kind of like this. Did I tell you about my orientation? I'm going to reveal to you today my orientation. My orientation is that I am a fallen creature prone to sinful and selfish behavior. But my identity is a new creation in Christ Jesus who has adopted me into God's own family and is grooming me for holiness. And so my identity is what I want to act on and hold on to and follow. Okay, okay. But don't we know from experience, that this is all easier said than done. You know, ridding ourselves of various sinful desires. Our sinful human nature, our orientation, is at odds with our new spiritual nature. We have to choose which one we're going to follow. Twice in Galatians chapter 5, Paul declares that believers are now free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, he says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Well, freedom is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It can also be a dangerous thing. It requires self-discipline 
internal discipline or it soon disintegrates into anarchy. Christ has set us free, free from the guilt of sin, free from the penalty of sin, free from the shame of sin, free from the power of sin, free from the power of the law to condemn us. Therefore, we can come to God at any time on the basis of the blood of Christ with the certainty that we will be accepted. You see, our freedom is first and foremost a spiritual freedom that opens up a new and everlasting relationship with God. But freedom does not mean that we do not struggle with sin any longer. We are not yet free from the presence of sin. That will only be the case in heaven. Nor are we free from the pull of the flesh that leads us into sin. We are free from the bondage of trying to please God through ceremonies and religious rituals. And we are free from the overwhelming guilt of sin that is like a mighty weight around our necks to tear us down. But sin itself remains with us, maybe even in us. And so, Pastor, are we really free then if sin is still in us? Well, yes, we are, because we are free to choose the right over the wrong. Before, we were powerless. Christ's freedom is never freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. It's the power to overcome, to get up and to fight the battle again and again and again so that sin does not defeat us. It is through the power of the Spirit that we are able to honor truly our Heavenly Father. Our spiritual rebirth be, brings us into God's family. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Well, that's simple. That makes sense. If you live by the Spirit, you won't want to gratify the human nature. To walk in the Spirit every day is, well, it's kind of like going full speed ahead one step at a time. Serious Christians. Christians who are honest with themselves, honest before God, have all asked this question at one time or another. Why is it taking me so long to get better and overcome my sinfulness? Parents, I know you're asking that about your teenagers. <laughs> Um, <laughs> just remember, it's not forever. But honest Christians ask that even about themselves. I thought by now I wouldn't struggle so much with my sin and my weaknesses. You know, I still get tempted, and, and sometimes I even fall into temptation. Some of the same old temptations I've been struggling with for years. What's taking so long? You know, I go to church every Sunday, and I still have doubts. I thought I'd be a better person by now, but I've still got a lot of bad habits. Why is it taking me so long to get better? You know, it, it would be so much easier if upon our commitment to Christ, our conversion, we would just sprout wings and fly off to heaven. But it doesn't happen that way. And it seems that God has ordained that even though we are being made more like Jesus, it only happens a little bit at a time. And sometimes that little bit seems very little indeed. When the children of Israel entered the promised land, God did not allow them to conquer it all at once. There were many entrenched enemies in the hills of Canaan, and the Israelites had to fight for every inch of it. Really, this is kind of a metaphor for the Christian life. There is victory to be had, for sure, but it will not come easily or quickly. We are in warfare with spiritual foes who will not give up their ground easily. Whether we like it or not, we will struggle with sin and temptation as long as we live. Did you hear that? 
We will struggle with sin and temptation as long as we live. There is no reprieve from this struggle. And that's one major reason why it takes so long for any of us to get better. Let's take a closer look at what it says in this passage from Galatians that Christy read for us a little bit ago. First thing I'd like to point out that we get from this passage is this. The struggle with sin is a normal part of the Christian life. Many Christians don't really like to hear this truth. They want victory in Jesus all the time, every day, everywhere. Victory in Jesus. You know, that's why I say, when people ask me, how you doing? I say, I'm on the winning team. Christ is the victor. I'm following him. But you know what? All of our problems and all our temptations are not going to be solved or go away all at once. That's not realistic or biblical. It says right there in Galatians, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. Two principles are at war within us, the flesh versus the spirit. The flesh is Paul's term for the sinful nature inside all of us by, by virtue of our physical descent from Adam, our natural birth. It comes with all the other equipment. That's just the way it is. Human nature is, by nature, hostile to God selfish, and also capable of great evil. Don't we know that? You've heard some people say, well, it's my way or the highway. What they're saying, really, it's my highway and not God's way. Sinful. It's my way. That's how most of us want to do it. My way, not God's way. When we come to Christ, we become new creations by virtue of the Holy Spirit who comes to live within us, that's our spiritual birth versus our physical birth. The new spiritual nature enters in. And even though the dominating power of the flesh is broken, and we can know that, the pull of that evil of the human nature still remains within us. And the result is that we have conflicting desires. With the same mouse, mouth, we curse and we bless. We love and we hate. We serve, and then we steal. We proclaim Christ, and then we lie to our friends and to ourselves. We read the Bible, and then we watch dirty movies. We sing in the choir, and then we gossip, and we tear down. And so it goes. The manifestations may differ, differ from person to person, but all of us feel the struggles in one way or another. Some days we're on God's path, and some days not so much we've wandered away. As a Christian, you have a new nature that pulls you toward God. That's the spiritual rebirth. While the flesh remains with you, pulling you the other direction, and that's going to be the case until you die. In one sense, Christians have conflicts that non-believers don't have. Our rewards are great, but so are our struggles. You know the old saying, opportunity knocks but once? And temptation bangs on the door every single day. The deadly feud between flesh and spirit is actually a good sign. It's the sign that we are children of God. Do you have any inkling in you that you want to please God? Is there a hunger in your heart to know Jesus and to love him more? And despite your personal failings, do you truly want to do what God wants you to do? I suspect you do. That's why you're here this morning. If your answer is yes, even for part of the time, it is strong evidence that you are a child of God because you recognize what family you really belong to. You struggle with sin because you want to be more like God. Jesus. It's proof of your divine heritage. If sin is a burden, does anybody have sin as a burden in their life? If sin is a burden, 
At least it is a burden and not a joy to you. Think about it. If you can engage in what the Bible says is sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and evil, drunkenness and orgies, and anything else you could add to that list. If you can engage in all of that and feel no shame or remorse, then you have a real problem. But the fact that you can recognize those things as bad and you don't want to go that direction is a sign that you are a child of God. Our ongoing struggles and temptations are not in themselves sinful. The sin is giving in, not the struggle itself. And friends, here's the bad news. No one escapes the conflict. No one gets a Christian life free from outward pressure and inward turmoil. There is no second blessing or spiritual experience that can magically propel you to a state uh, where you no longer struggle with sin. And that's not going to happen until we finally get to heaven. Between now and then, we walk the hard road to glory, fighting every day to stay on the right path. Some days, we start out great. God, I'm walking with you today, and I want you to walk with me. And by 10 o'clock in the morning, we've veered off. But you know what? As children of God, we can recognize that we have veered off. And we can say, Lord, pull me back onto the right Lord, the right, right road. The Holy Spirit can help us when we depend on him. We still have the choice to make. That's our freedom flesh or spirit, my way or God's way. Here's the second thing that I pull out of Galatians here. The struggle produces benefits. Wait a second. Are you telling me that this struggle with sin is going to bring something good in my life? Strange as it may seem, we need to struggle because that's the only way we can grow in grace. Think of it this way. You know some athletes, you've heard of athletes, you may have read of athletes. Say some athlete wants to grow a little more muscle. What does he or she do? Oh, she just lays in bed all day, right? That'll do it. Is that right? It'll just happen because she thinks or he thinks that she wants more muscles. Right? Is that right? No. She's got to go work out, pump some iron. And maybe feel a little soreness the next day. That's a sign. It's a struggle, but that's a sign that he or she is growing some muscle. Same thing in the spirit. The struggle is the only way we can grow spiritually and grow in God's grace. Here's a few benefits to consider. When we struggle with sin, it reveals to us our inherent weakness. If we could handle all sin, it wouldn't be a struggle, would it? It reveals to us our weakness, and it kills our pride, humbling us again and again. It forces us to cry out to God for help. It reveals the uselessness of human effort apart from God's strength. And it causes us, therefore, to love our Savior all the more, the one who can deliver us from sin. And so it leads us into a life of continual repentance. Anybody here had to repent more than once? It makes us more watchful against the encroachment of sin. And it makes us long for the rest of heaven. And it prods us to use all the means of divine grace. And so it encourages us to develop habits of holiness. And forces us even to lean on our brothers and sisters to help us out. And leads us to look for daily solutions in our struggle with sin instead of instant miracles. In your struggle with sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Jesus has done that for you. Third thing, the power of the Spirit. Many of us never realize the great power of the Holy Spirit the power he can have in our lives because we have not come to rely on him. We 
confess our sins, we repent, we believe Jesus has saved us and is making us anew, but we don't really rely on the Spirit because two seconds down the road, we're relying on ourselves again. We are powerless. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. When we continue to ask him to be the power in our living, these three things start to appear. First of all, he creates in us a new desire. Have you ever prayed that way? Holy Spirit, I struggle with this sin. Create in me a desire for this rather than that. Create in me a desire. Number two, he gives us power to obey. Holy Spirit, I am weak to follow this way. Give me the power. Number three, he leads us to live like Jesus would live. Holy Spirit, show me and lead me into his path. You see, our hope is not in rules, but in the person of the Holy Spirit indwelling every believer. By his power, we can obey God even in the midst of our ongoing struggle with sin. Walking always implies steady progress in one direction by means of deliberate choices over a long period of time. For example, my house is 6.2 miles from this place right here. I can get there by walking, can't I? Or let's make it even easier. Say I want to get to the doors right back there. I can get there if I take some steps down here and then put one foot in front of the other, making the choice and keep pointed in that direction. Walking will get you there. To walk and not faint, as it says in Isaiah, means that you keep going in that direction and you don't give up. It means to call on the Holy Spirit each and every day or even with every step if you need to. You know, walking is pretty slow compared to going by car or by plane. If I get in my car, it takes me 10 to 20 minutes, depending on my traffic, to get to my home. If I walk, it's going to take me two hours or more. But you know what? I can still get there by walking. All I got to do is put one foot in front of the other and keep pointed in the right direction. Sometimes it's tedious, sometimes it's dull, sometimes it's downright boring. Yet walking will get you there eventually. Even taking tiny steps in the right direction is progress. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to keep from falling and to stand without blemish one day in the presence of his glory. So keep walking in the right direction. It's full speed ahead, one step at a time. You know what? Getting across the finish line, getting to your true home with God is worth it even if you have to crawl there. Here's the, the best news of all. We are united with Christ. For we know that our old self, that's the, the physical descent, the human nature, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So I just want you to remember five things here as we close this out. Five things as we struggle with uh, this sin. And the struggle, of course, is, is, is not the sin itself. And it's evidence that we belong to God. So here's five things to remember. Number one, stay humble. Remember, it's God who will give you the power. We're not able on our own. Number two, pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for new desires. Number three, keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the leader of the pack. He's the captain of the team. He's the victor up there. And number four, Take little steps in the right direction every day. Okay? Does that work? Oh, was there five? 
Oh man, I have to make up something really fast here. Here's number five. When you fall, when you fall into temptation, for goodness sake, get up again and start walking again in the right direction. We hope in God because where sin abounded, his grace superabounded. Through the struggle with sin, your soul is made strong and you are being made fit for heaven. So stand and fight, child of God. The Lord is on your side. Amen.